live from the Orion Sinus Arm of the Milky Way Galaxy, this is Scientifically Speaking, a weekly half-hour program devoted to elegant curiosities, and I am one of your hosts, Sarah Chang. Joining me, as always, is Bernie Rhyme, DJ Starwatcher. How are you, Bernie? Yes, hi, Sarah. Good, thank you. Bernie's our professor of the Astronomy Lab at USM and our local protector of the night skies. Reach out to us at WMPG Scientifically Speaking at gmail.com or on Twitter at WMPG SciSpeak. And you can head to WMPG.org to find the last five weeks of archives of all of your favorite shows, including this one. Bernie, could you let our listeners know what is up in the night sky for this coming week? Okay, good. Certainly. Thank you. So today will be Friday, April 9th. So we're going to have a waning crescent moon. It'll be almost new moon. It'll be new on the 11th. So you won't be able to see it for several days. It comes up actually just before the sun. So you won't be able to see that. But you can see one planet in the evening sky, and that is Mars. Uh, that's still the same planet. It's been around for a while now. Um, basically, it's in Taurus. It was right near the Pleiades just a few weeks ago. And it's going to be near the Hyades, which is another cluster in Taurus. And it's going to move on into Gemini next month. So definitely look for Mars and think of the rover. By now, we should be getting ready to fly the little drone. Ingenuity, the first drone we ever flew on another planet. You also have to remember there's an 11 or 12 minute delay at the speed of light to get to Mars. But it's programmed enough so we don't have to wait. It has its own like little cameras that it can see things. Otherwise, we'd have to wait so we don't run into something or something might happen on Mars. So it's going to take care of that. So that'll be pretty neat. And then if you like to get up early, then you could see uh, Jupiter and Saturn in the morning sky. Uh, they've, they've disappeared from our evening sky in December of, of last year. So now you can see them in the morning sky. So uh, that's basically it for this week. Awesome. Thank you, Bernie. Matt, you're welcome. And if you couldn't take notes just fast enough, you can also check out the What's Up column in the Portland Press Herald. Today's show, we have a very special guest, um, Dr. Gary Lawless. Our show is titled The Multiverse of Gary, and we're focusing on poetry and poetry of the natural world and how our perspectives can be expressed in, through poetry. And so we're going to start off with a poem by him. Just tell me when to go. Go. <clears throat> this is a poem from Venice, Italy, where I spent a month uh, two years ago. Uh, and I was thinking about the bird migrations because Venice is on a, a lagoon, a beautiful lagoon, and there are still migratory bird routes through the lagoon. So this is a little poem for those birds. Where the outer islands meet the sea, walls of white Istrian stone, dunes, grasses, and oak, migration routes for thousands of years. Kentish terns and plovers now disappear Places taken by kingfisher, herring gull, black-backed gull, all these coots, ducks, heron and geese, sparrowhawk, osprey, kite. What follows when we are gone, gone forever? Wow. So I was wondering what species were replacing the species that were disappearing because, uh, you know, nature abhors a vacuum and something always comes to fill that niche. So the bird population has been changing as those migration routes are screwed up or the birds are killed. The Italians like to eat birds, uh, you know. So I was just trying to think about that myself. Like what and what's going to come after us? You know, uh, humans are not necessarily the apex of creation. So, I, you know, I have to keep telling myself that something else is even even when we die, what's going to happen? after we're gone, you know, just individually too. So it's, you yeah. know, it's one of those speculative things, but I tried to get, you know, I had to go and figure out who the birds were, which birds had been coming. I was going to ask and, you. <laughs> yeah. Which birds were no longer coming and which birds were now there. So, so that, that little poem has a bunch of information in it, you know, yeah. if you're interested in birds or migrations or, you know, it could be humans, you know, who came as tourists, <laughs> You know, the Goths were coming down for a while uh, out of Central Europe. And, you know, <laughs> now it's now it's uh, cruise boats. You know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Although what, not um, now. <laughs> <laughs> what types of things did you study? I mean, did you study um, kind of science history books on my birds in the area? Or did you read more like people's maybe diaries or journals from different eras and maybe the types of or maybe did you look at paintings <laughs> well you're right paintings 
paintings mm. are an interesting source uh, uh, we, we, well, mostly not just European paintings, Chinese landscape paintings, interesting sources of birds, of plants, of tree varieties. All of those things are documented in, in you know, a lot, especially in Italy with, with all the religious paintings, the backgrounds have these landscapes and they have trees and they have animals and they have things happening that weren't necessarily happening behind the baby Jesus. You know, you've got all mm -hmm. these saints who weren't alive for another 600 years all of a sudden showing up to, to say hi to mary uh but you know there, there is information sometimes it's in strange places um and i but my I, I was in venice because i was doing this project about where the stones came from that came to venice uh so the white istrian stone shows up in that poem because that's the basic building stone is venice is from over east of venice on the istrian Peninsula, there's this white limestone that that really um, has been used for a building stone in, around Venice, um, and it's it's used as barriers on the outer islands. There are barriers of of these of the Istrian stone too. So Did you ever? Um, I feel like something uh, that is in the news often regarding Venice is that it may <laughs> disappear soon. Did you ever look into that? Oh yeah, I mean you know. The, we were there in the fall. So there were, there were, there, it's, it, you know, when the tide comes up and it floods, it's called Aqua Alta. And we were there for a few Aqua Altas. And, the, and of course, the Italians have spent several, you know, millions of dollars building this gate system that they, they want to hold back the water, which didn't work for King Midas and it's not going to work for them. And, and the first time they tested it, the gates didn't work and they'd already spent millions of dollars. And they looked into it and the scientists said, oh, well, we forgot it was salt water. <laughs> and it might, it might hurt the metal. You know, I, I mean, it, it, a lot of people involved in the in this system have gone to prison, and, and oh. you know, but they but but basically they're denying climate change. They're denying climate change. They're denying the fact that water rises, <laughs> and and uh, also that you know there are Venice is basically a series of islands that are mud. There are no. I, I mean, I went there interested in stone because there's no obvious source of stone anywhere in that lagoon you know you don't have quarries on any of the islands and the the buildings are not on stone foundations they're on wooden pilings no. uh, you know that are down in the mud and as long as they don't come in contact with with oxygen they're pretty much preserved you know as, as long as the pilings don't come up out of the mud and meet the air uh, you know they're they're um, not petrified. What's what's the you know? There's a word yeah. for it. There's a scientific word that I, as a poet, can't remember. You know, so I was interested in in you know sand and mud and stone and uh, salt, which was a big thing in Venice. And and you know, there's one whole island in Venice, Murano, that's a glass making island. So I wondered, hmm. where's the sand come from? Because hmm. to make good glass, you need really pure sand. Hmm. You know, and it's there's not there's that. Lagoon does not have pure sand, you know. I, so things like that, and and um, looking at paintings from the Renaissance, I was wondering where the pigments came from. What what made that red? What made the blue? The blue is, is lapis lazuli from Afghanistan that came across the Silk Route to Venice and was turned into at that time the most expensive pigment for painters in Europe was this beautiful lapis lazuli. But then there's a Venetian red that was from quarries just west of, of, of Venice on the mainland. And um, Raphael, well, several of the painters, Giotto, uh, so a lot of the painters used that red and it was so popular. There were all there were paintings of women with red hair and Venetian women decided there was a craze where they all wanted that color hair. Mm. So they were, so, <laughs> yeah. So it's really kind of fun to see what influenced, the, you know, and then of course there's marble statuary all over the place. Like, yeah. what's that? But then I was interested in in like the cruise ships never turn off because they're floating hotels, so they're all always expelling, uh, you know, this this particulate into into the air, and the particulate um, mixes with the mist in the air in Venice, and it eats away marble. Um, wow. It basically makes sulfuric acid, yeah. uh, but but it eats away marble, and I'm thinking, well, if it eats away marble, what does it do to people's lungs? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, because because the tourists only stay there for you know a day or something, but but the boat is there pumping this stuff into the air, and and you know if you get a number of boats each day, and it's a foggy day or something, you know, uh, 
but you live in Venice or you work in Venice, how does that affect your lungs if it, if it eats marble? Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> That's fairly dramatic. But, you know, I was just sort of obsessed with, with anything stone related there for a while. It was a really fun project. And, but then I started thinking about the birds uh, because thinking about it originally, it was like, what were the original plants that were here? And what birds were here before people started coming here? Uh, you know, that, that kind of thing. So, Can I ask you something? Um, because I sense this so much from, when you, from, from you, and I think it's also one of the cornerstones of our show. But do you think that um, curiosity is something that is innate in everybody or is it a skill? I think that, well, to me, originally it's innate, but it's suppressed. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a, in a lot of cultures, we're, we're taught not to be curious about things or, or not, not to question, but to go along. You know, I, I, I'm sure that, for example, oil and gas companies really don't want us to be that curious about geology. <laughs> and they don't want us to be that curious about water courses or migration routes because it all ties into the, the, the despoilation mm -hmm. of places when you, st when you get curious about things like right. that. Don't ask too many um, questions. Don't ask too many questions. So I, I think there are cultures that raise, you know, my, my mother told me, you know, we, we don't really want to speak out. You know, we don't really want to question things because it brings attention on ourselves. Um, I don't necessarily want to bring attention to myself. I want to bring attention on some of those mm. issues of disappearances. I don't want those birds to disappear, you know, uh, um, or those groves. Uh, you know. the, the idea, part of what I was looking at was that what's sacred and what isn't. And I, I think everything has the potential of being sacred. Every, every place, every creature has the potential. And it's humans that decide this place is sacred. This creature is sacred. You know, uh, uh, this battlefield is sacred. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, so, so it's, it's, we bring that sense of the sacred and, and for different people, different things are sacred. You, when you look at people who live more closely to the watershed, like uh, Aboriginal people, native people, first peoples, what's sacred to them is really different from what's sacred to the then Protestant and Catholic arrivals mm -hmm. on the shore who have a whole different, you know, the Holy Land is not here. Mm -hmm. The Holy Land is somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in the Levant or it's in, uh, you know, or, or people, Irish people think Ireland is the Holy Land or, you know, <laughs> Catholic people think Jerusalem is the Holy Land. Yeah, I mean, yeah, or Rome uh, or, or Constantinople. There, was, there were places that were officially holy. Um, but that's a human thing, you know, I, I think. Mm -hmm. Did that answer that question or did it roam <laughs> too far away? <laughs> I was like, wait, cu from curiosity to Holy Land. <laughs> that, yeah, but there's that curiosity. There's, the, there's that idea of where can we go to be closer to God? Right, right, right. And, and how do we do that? I mean, you know, some, with some, with the Orthodox religion, it's icons. Mm -hmm. And with the Catholic religion, it's relics. And, mm -hmm. and with some other religions, it's, it's places where the lightning hit the ground or, or where there are these certain wonderful trees. I mean, people now, I think uh, you know, the, the COVID vaccine has got, I think has gotten people more going out and seeing the trees and plants around where they are. Yeah. And, and I think people heard more birdsong this year than they heard in previous years. And maybe Bernie's got them going out and looking at the sky more than they have. I mean, there are all these things right around us that we can explore if we have that curiosity. Why haven't we been curious about what's happening right where we are? Yeah. So um, last show you had mentioned in your, your brief introduction, <laughs> that you had worked with, um, you'd worked with combat vets, you'd worked with, um, Preble Street, you'd work with um, Somali immigrants in Lewiston. What, um, and, and that was to, to do poetry work, right? And writing mm -hmm. work or? That was the way in. Yeah. I mean, what I really wanted was to get people to feel comfortable telling their own stories. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people in Maine who, for one reason or another, for example, can't read or write. 
mm-hmm. and that they're not necessarily a disability homes. You know, are, they're not necessarily at centers for the disabled. They're, 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 you know, there are just there are some Americans who have learning disabilities and, and can't read or write, but can camouflage it really well. And I, I wanted to go in and work and tell people I don't, you know, it's fine if you don't read or write. I know you can tell a story. I know you can tell me a story. We'll write it down. We'll read it back to you. And if it's the way you want it. We'll keep it. If it's not the way you want it, we'll change it. We don't want to tell you how to tell your story. We just want to encourage you to tell your story. And I think that all of us learn from hearing, we learn how to get along with each other when we hear those stories. And I, I you know, I, for a long time, I've, I've thought that the greatest gift I can give to someone else in Maine is to listen to them with my heart, you know, mm. and, and, and listen to their story and, and be, and it's, it's, you know, it, there are people who are treated as commodities or somehow dangerous uh, because they are in a circumstance that we can't even understand. We can't, fa- when I, when I first went to Preble street, I think 60% of the folks at Preble street had some type of mental illness because the state had just shut down all the centers where the mentally ill had been kept. And all of a sudden, there's no money for safety nets and people are roaming around and the only people paying attention to them are, are the police and they're not trained to deal with, they're not trained to deal specifically with people having mental issues, you know, uh, crises, mm-hmm. you know, they, they arrest them or they shoot them. You know, I mean, stuff happens. I'm, and I'm not, I don't mean to be pejorative to the, to the police either. I think they're not funded or trained for it's It's not what we want them to do somehow. Um, but I thought, man, you start hearing those people's stories and realizing, you know, three paychecks down, you're there too, mm. you know, or one bad car accident. You know, all the, there are all these moments when, you know, when we're all the same people. Um, and I think, and, and, you know, it's, it's poetry is one way of talking to people, people who won't tell me stuff will write poems because it's somehow it's a different way of expressing yourself and it's okay to talk about inner turmoil or inner joy uh, in a way that doesn't, it won't come up in your conversation day to day and you won't tell your counselors and you won't tell the people prescribing your meds. And, uh, you know, uh, That's not who you're going to tell your story to. Uh, but if someone really, really shows interest and listens and doesn't try to tell you how to tell your story, um, you can make important steps, both of you. I mean, not, I learned so much. I learned so much from the folks that I, I, I'm still learning, you know, and, and, and working, like when I work at the Center for Disabilities, I, 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 we go out to high schools and talk about it. And I, I tell people, well, all right, stand on one leg. Now your other leg doesn't work. Do you feel intellectually or emotionally diminished less than the people around you? Uh, close your eyes. Now you're blind. Do you feel intellectually or emotionally less than the people around you? Mm. Imagine that you're in a place where no one else speaks your language. Do you feel intellectually diminished or emotionally diminished? You, you come here from Burundi. You can't speak English. Does that make you a lesser human being? Of course not. You know, but do the people around you have what you were talking about? Do we have curiosity? about who these folks are and what they have to offer and what they know, because they know stuff, you know. Uh, it's, it's, I'm fascinated by that. And that's just, that's me. You know, it's, it's not, I'm not saying that this is what poetry has to do. This is what human beings have to do. It's just what I like to do. And I like to think that it helps a little bit uh, to get more voices into the conversation of the community. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know? And so with this work, um, the writing workshops with all of these various populations and groups and people, you were awarded a, an honorary PhD from USM. How did that, how did that happen? How did uh, the word get that out? That was a large mistake, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it happened uh, basically through a professor who's no longer there. Uh, uh, but I, I was doing stuff in Lewiston with a group of his uh, Somalis. This is back in the early 90s when it was a new thing to have uh, Somali folks arriving here. I think in Lewiston, I think folks from Togo were the first people to, to get housed in Lewiston because they said, well, people in Lewiston speak French and Togolese people speak French. So they'll get along fine. You know, 
overlooking a few things there, you know, but, but it's nice to have a language connection, you know, in Brunswick, we've got people who, who are coming now who speak Portuguese and, and it's not a language that you can get a lot of uh, speakers to volunteer to work with them because, I mean, the French speakers, yeah, we can, you can do that, but, you know, it's just like, what languages can we use? And I, I for, I, you know, I, I did, like, I did poetry with deaf folks and their language is sign language and it's mm -hmm. gorgeous it's gorgeous their poems are dances you know and it's wonderful and there are so many of them among us and we don't learn their language we don't learn a common language with them uh and i feel really bad that that i uh, you know i i have a little tiny bit but i i i really feel like i should have learned more of that also because it's really interesting i mean it, to see and and because I was an East Asian studies major, uh, and and was learning Japanese and looking at Japanese and and uh, Chinese characters or kanji, the the original way of of writing, uh, used by those cultures were very pictographic and very very imagistic, you know. And sign language is also imagistic and pictographic, and it, it's it's harder to sign philosophical ideas than it is to sign nouns and verbs. You know, I mean, it's it's a uh, or that's a generalization, and I don't mean to to even say that because I I don't know the language that well. But you know, just that idea of different ways of making of bringing words out into the world uh, intrigued me as as a as a poet. I mean, there's there's a science there. there I mean, linguistics is uh, there's a science there of how people choose to express not only what they're seeing but what they're feeling, and then agree on it. You know, I mean, and language is constantly evolving. Um, mm. So, so you know, things that poets said in the 17th and 18th century, we wouldn't, and they're, you know, English language poets, we wouldn't use that language now, you know. Uh, we might think it's beautiful or we might think it's out of date. Um, and then, you know, like, because I go to Italy a lot, Italian poets are so lucky. <laughs> All those Italian words end in vowels, man. It's so easy to rhyme in Italian. You know, that Dante had it easy, you know, because <laughs> you can make things rhyme really easily. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But he chose to write in a in a low language. You know, he he wrote he wrote in, in Florentine Italian oh, and yeah, he didn't yeah. write in Latin. Mm -hmm. Um so so for a long time. He was looked down upon, and the, his first American translator, Dante's first American translator, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, mm -hmm. Portland's man. You know, he was Dante's. He was he published the first translation of the Inferno uh, in in the U.S. Uh, and uh, Harvard didn't want him to do it because they didn't want to teach Italian. Mm -hmm. It was it was a low language. I mean, Italians were were you know, bad immigrants back then. You know. <laughs> I mean, look at the line of bad immigrants in this, you know, French people, Italian people, Irish people, Chinese people. You know, I mean, just, who's the bad person this month? You know, and where are they from? You know? Always trying to find the next one. Oh, it, there's always the next one. We always need <laughs> someone to look down on, you know? I'm sorry. Let's end on a positive note. We've got a couple minutes left. And there's a story about Henry Beston that I don't know anything about. Okay. Um, okay. Bernie's Bernie, what is what is this? Yeah. Well, he wrote a great book. Uh, he's a naturalist called The Outermost House. He spent a whole year in Cape Cod. I think it was in the late 1920s. Um, I think Henry David Thoreau was out there too for a while. It might have been after that. And um, so he wrote this book that I use in some of my classes, actually. And I tried to go see the house, but the house got washed away in 1978. The okay. little house on the beach that he lived in for a whole year. But Gary actually lives in the house that Henry Beston bought up in Maine. Yeah. So, so Henry was, uh, he graduated from Harvard in, uh, just before the First World War. And he and a group of Harvard students volunteered to be ambulance drivers. And because Henry spoke fluent French, they put him right on the front lines in Verdun. And so for a year, he hauled away maimed and broken bodies of young men, uh, primarily young men. Um, as an ambulance driver, just saw horror, horror. And then he came back to the US and he did a very sensible thing. He went out to live by himself in a shack on the beach at the very end of Cape Cod and just observe the cycle of seasons. And it turned out that he was a very beautiful, oh, he wrote very beautiful prose. 
and the book became a, a huge early 20th century nature writing uh, classic. And the, the place where he lived is now a national seashore. Uh, he, he was, you know, prominent in getting that part, that part of the world protected. But then he, 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 he was in Massachusetts and it was too much. So he and his <laughs> wife moved to a, a farm on the end of a dead end road in Nobleboro, Maine, where there weren't people. Uh, his wife was a, a writer named Elizabeth Coatsworth, who she published 127 books in her lifetime. Henry published 25. Their daughter, Kate Beston Barnes, was, was the first poet laureate for the state of Maine. Uh, back about 20 years ago. So it was, and they all lived here in this house where, where Beth and I now live. Um, we came here to be the caretakers of the house when, when Elizabeth, Co Henry died in 1968 and his wife died in 86. So Beth and I moved here in 86 to take care of the house. And there were six horses here. And the, and, and, How did and the you farms. get connected? Did you? I own a bookstore. I own a bookstore. <laughs> My wife and I have a bookstore. And, and the daughter, Kate Beston Barnes, was a good customer. And we became friends. Uh... And, and when her mother passed away, the, the, the house was full of their stuff. And there were six horses here. And they needed some, somebody to come live here to oversee all that stuff. So we came here in 1986. And we're still here. <laughs> were you living in Maine at the time? I've always lived in Maine. Yeah. So uh, we, yeah, we had our bookstore in Brunswick. Um, so she was, you know, and, and we had lived in for 10 years in a cottage with no plumbing and a wood stove and you know, it was pretty funky. And so the idea of having a, a 90 acre farm on a lake with horses was, was kind of appealing. Hmm. I didn't, I didn't know how much work that might entail, <laughs> but it seemed good at the you just, time. You just said, sign me up. <laughs> yeah. But but Henry's book still, I mean, they get lots and lots of requests for people writing science and naturalism stuff mm -hmm. who want to quote from Henry's book. So, and it stay the Outermost House has been in print continuously since 1929, and it still sells. And people, a lot of people quote it because it has some very, very beautiful passages, including mm -hmm. a whole chapter about the night sky, which I think yeah. Bernie probably enjoyed reading. Yeah. 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 My favorite so, chapter. Yeah. So, we, you know, all of our life is we've got a bookstore, we live in the house of writers, we, we, we write, we, you know, it's, it's, it's all connected. It's all connected. Hmm. And that concludes our multiverse two-part <laughs> series with Gary Lawless, Dr. Gary Lawless. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us and for, for being willing to share your story here on Scientifically Speaking and with our listeners on WMPG 90.9. I hope you had fun too. <laughs> yeah, th thanks for this opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to Scientifically Speaking here on WMPG with myself, Bernie, and Gary Lawless. Stay tuned for Sports Jam with Colin and Connor and from your favorite nerds, mask up and we wish you healthy bodies and clean air.